This week we go one on one with most likely the one that invented the fishing podcast. Recently retired from Bass Talk Live, the one and only Mark Jeffries. <laughs> I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. I am Dave Mercer. Welcome once again. And the only thing I've always promised you guys is honesty. So I'll be honest right now. I'm not here right now. When you're watching this, I'm actually in Florida but I wanted to make sure, I mean, we were going to do this from Florida, but I wanted to make sure I got it to you guys and then we didn't have to mess around because so much moving pieces when you travel. So uh, we recorded it before I left. So congratulations to whoever won the Palaka event last week. That was awesome, hopefully. And uh, really looking forward to seeing how they do on the Harris chain. But without further ado i think we need to jump right into this show because this is going to be a fun one and this dude's probably done more fishing podcasts than anybody i mean he hosted them all um bass talk live and and so many things that mark jeffries did and now he stepped away from this side of the camera and i thought before he steps away too far we need to get him here i mean so many cool things that he did over the years you know whether it be bass talk live all the stuff with bass zone the 20 foot deep series amazing amazing stuff i mean in the digital world mark jeffries was truly a trailblazer for the fishing industry and uh, i'm thankful that he's going to take a few minutes out of his life right now to join us ladies and gentlemen the one and only mj mark jeffries mark jeffries i have never felt more out of place in my life i am not supposed to be introducing you normally you're in you're in the command seat right now but First of all, I want to thank you for years and years of entertainment. Obviously, yeah. the hosts of Bass Talk Live, originally Bass Zone. And, dude, you are the original freaking podcast. You yeah, that's kind of cool, before man. Before there was a podcast. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, actually, I'm sitting in the chair of the king of the studio now. And it, and it was a little out of whack. It was kind of a little high. You know, I had to make a few adjustments, but... Now, Matt has taken over the reins, and so far, he's done a fantastic job, and there's nobody else that could fill this seat uh, that I know of other than Matt. So, he's doing a great job, and man, I'm loving retirement. How weird has it been, Like, or has it been weird at all? I would just think hosting a show as often as you guys did. Yeah. I mean, there be... Uh, it must feel, does it feel different or is it like, I'm thankful that I don't got to go? No, it, it is a little different from the perspective that I still see Matt every day yeah. that he's doing the show from the studio because, you know, we got the cat and I have to take care of the cat every morning. So <laughs> I see him uh, and, and we talk and, you know, he's had to be trained on a lot of stuff because technology, the dude may know how to use a graph, but this stuff right here sometimes becomes a little challenging. So, uh, you know, we've spent some time uh, getting him trained and working on stuff. But no, man, I still do my same exact routine every morning, every single day, even when I was part of the show and, and sat in this chair. Uh, you know, I'm still, I, I'm not as connected, but I still follow a lot of things that are taking place in the industry. I'm excited for the season to get started. There's a lot to look forward to. And, uh, you know, I kind of had the business side discussions when, when I was on BTL and, and Matt are right here. I still follow a lot of stuff from a business perspective that's going on in the industry. So it's been different. It's been exciting. Uh, my stress level has come way, way, way down. And it's Sundays now, because typically Sunday I would come into the studio and I would set up the show and make all the changes and all that. And the past few weekends ever since Matt's taken over it has been so nice not to have to stress out about meeting a deadline or you know somebody cancels out or schedules change or whatever it is that you're dealing with I just kind of sit back and you know I'm kind of on the uh, Netflix thing right now I'm watching football and I'm stuck on a, on a, on a couple of next 
uh, Netflix series. What What are you binging on Netflix? Oh, the the latest season of Ozark. Oh, that's such a wild show, isn't it? <laughs> I I actually finished it last night. Okay, don't give any details. No, I'm not going to give anything away pissed. for the people. But uh, shocking, shocking I season. It. I have not uh, finished this season, but yeah, we had a rough night last night on the road. The the basketball team that I coach, rough night. Uh, lost by twenty. Came home, couldn't sleep. So I just watched the next two episodes. Of Ozark, and it's cool because it's funny. Some of the aerial shots that they have of Lake of the Ozarks. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, I've Carolina rigged that spot there. You know. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> by the way, by the way, recently, did you see what the college kids did on a Carolina rig down Insane. in Florida? Insane. And people want to rag on me about throwing the Carolina ring. I, I hope it holds out because we're heading right there. And I, and I, I mean, it was it awesome to see. Yeah. So let's, let's go back because okay. long before there was, I mean, it's easy to start a podcast nowadays. It's easy to do this kind of thing. I mean, yeah. there's, there's videos out there that'll show you how to do it, but dude, oh yeah, you literally in this, in the fishing industry, you were a trailblazer. You were the, like, I don't think anybody can say, I mean, there's radio shows and stuff that have been around that yeah. evolved into podcasts, but this is, is your baby. Um, yeah. How, why, what was the, urge to do it initially like why did you why did you initially feel like the world needs this well uh, two things happen and the story's been well documented matt and i have talked about it on the show but kind of the cliff note version is i was wrapping up my career at ups yeah. i knew i was on the downhill of the sign curve of being in the corporate world i had just had enough uh they wanted me to transfer to the pacific rim and i was like come on guys seriously Really? I said, send some young guy over there to clean up the mess that's taking place. I said, I'm an old guy. I'm getting ready, you know, to get to a point where I just want to kind of settle down and do my, and, and they're like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. So they sent me back to a district as a district controller. And I, you know, there was a situation that took place. I just sat there one day after getting absolutely ripped by my district manager and just kind of, you know, looked around and decided, yeah, I think uh, professional fishing does need a beat writer that's independent because I was into the whole fishing thing. I, it, Matt and I have discussed it numerous times about how I got into bass fishing yeah. and the people that were around me. And, and Oklahoma was insane when this was taking place, Dave. Every single weekend, guys were fishing for fifteen dollars to $25,000. Every single weekend from the month of March – Till the end of June. Wow. It was insane. And, and you're talking about two, three, 400 boat tournaments. So uh, it was an epic time in Oklahoma when it comes, comes to uh, tournament fishing. And with the announcement of the formation of the Elite Series and what I refer to as the donut lady ripping me a new one in my office, <laughs> it, was, it was time to move on. And I had, I had done a really good job at it planning for this time, both mentally, physically, and financially, that it, it was time to make a move. And uh, I had long discussions with Gene Gilliland. I had long discussions with uh, a guy by the name of Pat Sheeler, who was a really, really close friend of mine who used to be my team partner who worked at UPS and uh, decided that because of my witnessing of what was taking place in other sports, because I was a sports nut, still yeah. am. Baseball, basketball, hockey, every one of those sports, there were what I classified beat riders that yeah. followed each of the teams. Now, it's different now, obviously, and it was different 20 years ago, but you had that one dude that everybody knew in the organization who that dude was and who the guy was that was going to report the story. And most of the time, the beat riders had the momentum on their side and the support. Now, obviously, there were exceptions. And believe me, there were exceptions with me, too. But I, I decided to make that move and show up to Lake Onestead at the very first Elite Series event with a laptop, a video camera, a digital recorder, uh, a cardboard box, of which I've discussed, because the first time I ever covered anything on the water, you couldn't see the laptop. Yeah. So I, I went to Home Depot and bought this big box that I put over my head 
so I can actually see the screen as I was describing the action that was taking place on the water. So that's kind of how it all got started. And uh, the evolution over the years was as the technology got better, I tried to stay ahead of the game and really kind of put the technology at the forefront of being that independent beat rider uh, that really didn't exist. And it was funny too, because year after year, you started to see the evolution of uh, this Jeffries dude, he, he's got a pretty good idea here. I think I can do it better than him. And then people started to show up and then other things started to happen. And then it just, it gradually got to the point where it was, well, wait a minute, I'm not making any money. These people decided, well, I'm not just going to do this for rods and reels or lures yeah. or whatever. And they took a different approach and, you know, you'd see people come, you'd see people leave. And in several discussions with people that have been in this game for a long time, there's been very, very few people that had the longevity to do what I did over those years. But you know what, man? The only way that that happened was staying ahead of the game. If you were stagnant, if you were stale, if you didn't adapt and be for, forward-looking at how you can make your product better to tell the story about what was taking place both on and off the water, you got left behind. Isn't that, in your opinion, and I, I feel this more and more, but isn't that the truth about life? Like, really, like, you <laughs> replace, not, honestly, more and more, like, you replace... Whether you want to be an elite series pro, whether you want to be what, if you think that you're going to come with the set of skills that you've had over these years and just continue on with those set of skills, you're going to yeah. get left behind. I mean, yeah. it, it truly is well, more and more apparent this. to me. I, I use this example a lot. What if you actually got your leads for some apparent reason from the yellow pages? How long are you going to be in business? Not very long. Not very long. <laughs> You know, not very long. So you, yeah. you have to adapt. And, and sometimes change is difficult. But I, I really, even that first year that I was out there, Dave, I really tried to establish that the story was not about me. It had nothing to do with me. The story was about the guys that were doing what they were doing, that were trying to make a living catching fish. And I tried and, and I felt that I, I did succeed in telling those stories from a journalistic perspective. And, and I think that that, you know, that thing that, that people refer to now is, you know, educate, entertain, and engage, even though it's different today, that concept still existed when I started many, many years ago. And I, I, you know, not just, and I don't even know how much you know of this, but but I mean, I, I can concur that that is totally true because long before I worked for Bass, you know, when the Elite Series first started, yeah. the first five years of the Elite Series, obviously I didn't MC it, but I watched every tournament and I looked at like I'd, I'd go to Bassmaster.com and I'd go to your site. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you both had galleries and I'd look through. That's how I saw everything that happened as a fan. And in in some ways, was it? Was it easier or harder? I mean, the technology was a lot harder, I imagine, but in some ways yeah. it had to be easier because there was only two places, very few places that you could yeah. get any kind of information from. Yeah, the, the technology was very challenging in the beginning yeah. because think about the evolution of the internet just itself during that period when, yeah. when we were trying to do things that uh, it, it, we just couldn't do. We wanted to do them, but we just couldn't do them because the technology wasn't there yet. And many, 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 many nights uh, were 24-7 were because I was committed to doing what I was there to do. Yeah. And I never, ever, in all the years that I covered the Elite Series uh, and the FLW Tour and anything else that we did, it was all about we have to deliver the product and whatever yeah. it takes. I, I remember when the Classic was in Florida, in Orlando, the first time. And we were staying on one of the resorts on the Disney World, yeah. whatever it is. Anyway, and I had a major, major computer issue. And money was tight then. We had four people staying in a room. And I was like, sorry, guys, I got to work this out. And they finally all went to sleep. And I sat there and I worked all night long, finally got it figured out. 
And back then you didn't have, even in hotels, even at Disney, you didn't have the high speed connectivity that we have today. Yeah. So even though I was working on just this 10 minute video, it took hours to upload. And just to get to that point where I was able to upload uh, was a challenge, but I was extremely committed uh, and dedicated to making sure that the product was going to be and the, and the assets that, that we had available were being utilized to the fullest to complete the work that we were responsible for. Were you ever, did you ever have a moment where you're like, uh, screw this? I'm- no, no, <laughs> now I had some frustrating moments. You know, I broke some cameras, not the high dollar ones, right? <laughs> what I called the disposable ones. Yeah. I broke some cameras. I've thrown stuff, especially in those early years, because it, it's so easy, easy to visualize what you want to do. And then when you can't do it, that's where I had major issues in my younger years. I was like, why is this not working? But that actually helped me on down the road because there was no manual. There wasn't a book. There wasn't Google that you could go into and find all these answers. YouTube wasn't even around then yet. So you had to figure it out yourself. And I think that made the product better. I think it made the brand better. And I think we are in the position that we're in today with what Matt is continuing because of that dedication to not accepting something not working, basically. And I think that that's a trait, honestly, that I see literally every successful person I know in anything. And and I'm not just talking financially successful. You you judge the success in any way you wish, but I'm talking happy people that are achieving the goals. There are people that don't give up. I mean, too often in today's world, you see people screw it. It's just not worth it. What does it matter? You know? And, and I think that that, that repetition and that always knowing that you'd be there yeah. no matter what, you know what I mean? Like nobody saw what you went through, but, but as a viewer, you just knew that there was going to be content there. Yeah. There was other sites that you would see content and then you wouldn't in the future. You know what I mean? Or you yeah. would every other tournament. I think that repetition and that, and I think it's just something that's in successful people too, that, to no, it's going out. I, we're not making an excuse why it's not going out. Yeah. We're going to figure out a way to make it go out. I just think it, it, it created more validity to what yeah. we were trying to accomplish by being there. You know, we had the tagline early when we started uh, the Bass Zone and, and Bass Talk Live. It's all about being there because during that time, the only way that information was being relayed to anybody was on a cell phone. In other words, interviews were being done. All right, tell me about your day. Well, no, I don't want you to tell me about your day. I want you to show me visually about your day. And that was really the first time that it was done from an independent standpoint. Uh, And and I took a lot of pride in that because, man, it was a huge investment. That's the other thing that people don't realize. They always talk about how expensive it is to be on whatever tour. Well, think about how expensive it is to cover it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, and, and the, the, the support, the early support that I had from so many companies and, and a few of those companies are still with us, but uh, the, the opportunity and, and the chance that they took with what I believed in, that was another reason why I worked so hard was to show them the value that they were getting from uh, the, the money that they were making us you know, uh, support and, and be able to be out there on tour with the guys. I just, that was a huge, huge, huge sticking point. I I thought if you're going to cover the game, you got to be there. How many beat writers, right? In the nineties and even today are in that stadium or in that arena and in the locker room, finding out exactly what went down. Now the format might be a little different, but that presence is still there. And I think in the beginning, and I think over the years that a lot of the guys that were out there doing it, they respected the fact that I had skin in the game and I was putting everything I had, both from a monetary standpoint, from a physical standpoint, and from an experience standpoint, to be out there in the trenches with them. Yeah. And I think that, that that's a part of the relationship that nobody... 
I mean, when you, even with the angler, you know, with the anglers, if you're on the water with them, when something happens, there's a bond. You know what I mean? If you're following oh, yeah. a leader or something in and, and just the fact that they see you there every morning. I mean, I just think that it, you're instantly accept and, and yeah. what better way to cover things? Yeah. You know, two of the greatest things that I will never forget. And one of them is actually, where's it at? Oh, it's sitting right there was I was the only boat around Steve Kennedy when he broke the record at Clear Lake. There was nobody else around. Yeah. And I was actually with him when he hooked that fish that he would have absolutely obliterated the record, but because of the California law, he had to put it back. Yeah. Uh, it, it was amazing. Some of the photos and, and just that dialogue that Steve and I had from the from the water and, and to capture that raw emotion was really the first time that 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 had been blogged and tried I tried to transfer the emotion to the fans that were watching and and it was it was massively emotional when we got back to the to the ramp and we just sat there and we talked and and, and you know it was a once in a lifetime experience uh the other thing too is is I I've talked about this maybe once, but you know, there, there's some things that you see out there that, that are sad too. And, and, and you see it because we sit, when I was out there, we saw a lot of times the emotion that takes place behind stage. Yeah, We see a lot of times the financial pressure that takes place behind stage at the hotels, wherever we're staying at. And sometimes my heart would bleed for these guys that have sacrificed everything and just cannot catch them. The other thing is, is uh, you know, there was a situation, and I'm not going to say the angler, but there was a situation where uh, an angler actually got placed in the penalty box for a okay. while, right? Because the camera boat that I had and the camera boat driver that I had pointed something out that I didn't even notice. Yeah. And he pointed something out that we took pictures of it. Then the next thing I know, you know, Trips asking me, you know, hey, what is this you're talking about? And, you know, if you wouldn't have been there, that that situation may or may not have ever occurred. But it worked out well because that angler, he got in the box and he went out and he blasted him the same day. But just with all the positive that I've seen, I think sometimes the realization of how difficult this sport is really, really sets in when you're on location. Yeah, I think, and, and you... You're invested in, you see every, it's not just them. You see the reaction of the, of their loved ones, whether it be kids or wives, girlfriends, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, um, it, it's definitely a connection. And I think that's what drives everybody that is part of this sport because yeah. you really do, you know, it's not just somebody who wins something and jumps in a jet and flies away. You know what I mean? You see yeah. people's lives change, like, you know, in the short time, like in the last number, look at, Seth Fighter went from almost not being part of the tour to possibly being the most dominant person on the tour, obviously yeah. last year. Um, it, it's it. I think everybody gets invested in it from that yeah. standpoint. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I'm really proud of that, that Matt and I and Harold Allen and Dave Rush and everybody else that's been involved over the years was we reported factual information. Yeah. And, I, and, and in other words, there wasn't an agenda. There wasn't, you know, we had to do this and we had to say that and we had to cover this. It was the true breath of what was taking place at these events with no agenda, no platform uh, to, to be on a soapbox or anything like that. It was a journalistic approach that just wasn't there from an independent standpoint. And, uh, you know, I think, I think Matt will continue that presence that, that I think is very, very important, especially in this day and age, because so much influence takes place from so many things now, Dave, yeah. that that trust factor that whoever's sitting in this chair and, and, and that chair, the trust factor that the fans and the anglers have to have in the individuals that are in front of these mics now is priceless. It really is yeah. because uh, the, the, you know, the, the structure is there, but the trust has to be there to go along with it. 
Does yeah. that make sense? Uh, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, yeah. and that's, that's the advantage of those relationships. You know what I yeah. mean? That's, that's what ultimately makes the, you know what I mean? It, yeah. You're not, you're not just trying, you know what I mean? You're invested yeah. in that relationship. All right. Let me ask you a question oh, oh, wow. since I'm See, back here. in front Look, of the mic. All right. All right. Do you That's ever, do you ever, have you ever just sat back in your studio, in your living room, in your basement, in your boat, wherever, and just thought, man, it's pretty incredible that guys can actually go out and make a living catching fish. Uh-huh. Have you ever thought about that, Dave? Uh, I literally, I swear to you, I said it earlier today to somebody <laughs> because I said, because, I, because we got in the conversation of what if tournaments were this and what if tournaments were that? And what yeah. if we, and I'm like, you know, do you ever stop and think that our industry does a really bad job of just appreciating what it has? You know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. kind of tired of hearing people argue about whether they should charge money into the classic or not and different we have an arena full of people that come to watch you hold up your fish. Yeah. It's pretty friggin' phenomenal when you think of the, what it has become, you know, like really when you compare it to other sports that really in a lot of ways are bigger, but they're not as big as fishing. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I, think I call it, it, it's the swimming pool in the ocean. That's what I, uh, I've used that forever is that that swimming pool might be an Olympic sized pool. But everybody else that's out there, they're swimming around in the ocean. And, yeah. and the challenge is to get those people from the ocean into the swimming pool. You get them in the swimming pool, all right? Don't just dip your toes in the shallow end. You need to start doing laps, all right? That's kind of how I look at it. You've seen a lot of stuff happen in this sport, obviously. I mean, the, the, yeah. the years. Before we move on to that, but I do want to ask you, like, now that you've pull the plug on your on air part of this. Yeah. And we're not seeing, and you've had, you know, you've talked about your history and everything. Did, did that process kind of like, do you realize kind of all the cool things that you had done in the sport <laughs> of that? Because I mean, I'm sure you're just living life. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, what are we going to do next year? And then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, man, we have done some pretty incredible things over yeah. the years. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a person, his, his name was, I called him Mr. Knight, all right? And Mr. Knight happened to be the district manager at the time at UPS when I got promoted. And back then, you had to go see Mr. Knight before you were officially promoted into supervision or management or whatever. And, and Mr. Knight sat there and, and, dude, I'm telling you, this guy was like the godfather, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this dude had... So much power, so much money. Just he, he was, I mean, you know, $1,400 pinstripe suit. He was the man. And he looked at me and he said, Mark, he said, I'm going to tell you one thing. He said, no matter what you do with this company, he said, as long as you take care of the customer, take care of your family, and take care of your children, you will be successful at UPS. I kind of looked around and I was like, all right, I, 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 who's coming out of the, the walls or the closet or whatever, uh, you know, his bodyguards or whatever. And, and he, he said, look, he goes, welcome to UPS. Welcome to management. All right. Just do what you're able to do at the highest level. He said, things will be good. And then he told me a couple other things. Don't ever lie to me. Don't ever <laughs> cheat and don't ever steal. But, <laughs> but no, he, he, he told me that. And I reflect in a lot of the, the way that I ran this media company, little tiny media company that I started way back when, was a lot of the UPS principles that have changed over time. But those core principles that, that Al Kite taught me is really what I established and really tried to strive for. One of those was always having a plan. It was, it, it, I, I knew when I got to a certain point with this business, I was ready to walk away. Now, there were some other reasons why I walked away, and I talked about that on the yeah. retirement show, because physically, I have some physical challenges, and there's still some things that I want to try and accomplish 
while I can physically do it. But I knew that when we got to a point and when this company got to the point that I had reached, that it was time for me to walk away. But more importantly, I had a plan for Matt. And I knew it was the right time to let Matt take over the reins when we were on top. I mean, who wants to take over something that's in total disarray? Nobody. <laughs> All right. And, and he's trying to do something that, that hopefully we will talk about also. He's trying to do something that is really, really hard. And that's Incredibly balance hard. business with fishing and fishing at the level that he's trying to fish at and, and, and keep that momentum going on a successful media asset that we have. That is a challenge. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I knew it was time to go because I had reached the goal that I established for myself. I had reached the goal that I established for my company. And I had reached the goal and got to the point where I knew it was the right time for Matt to take over. That's why I knew. So what does the future hold for for, <laughs> B- B- for yeah. me? I mean, for you, I mean, you're going to chase I are you chasing the bowling dream yeah that- yeah yeah I, and and physically that's the biggest challenge right now with the game uh you know my plan is uh the U.S. Senior Open takes place in June I will be bowling in that first time I bowled this the U.S. Senior Open uh I'm also going to bowl the Senior Masters in Las Vegas uh I'll continue to bowl PBA regional stuff uh but I'm 60 years old Dave well I'm going to be 60 this year. Uh, if people think that bowling is just beer and pizza, hey, let's go have a good time, throw a couple of shots, you know, blah, 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 blah. It truly does take a physical toll on your on your body if you do it at the level that you have to do it at yeah. to be successful. And, you know, you know me, Matt knows, obviously knows me. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to be dedicated to it. I'm not just going to do it halfway or do it to the level that you just get by. You know, I have this term called the MAR, M-A-R, and that's a UPS thing too, and it stands for the minimum acceptable requirement. All right, well, I'm not into doing the minimum acceptable requirement where I lose money. (laughs) Losing money is not good. So if I'm going to do it, I'm going to try and do it at the level that, number one, I have fun. Two, I enjoy it. Three, I compete. And four, I'm not going to do it if I continue to lose money. I've worked hard for the money that I have. Yeah. All right. And and I just think that that at the level that I'm at right now and the level that I can get to over the next year, that I may have two, maybe three years left in me physically, that if I'm able to compete, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to bowl, you know, maybe six national events a year and then continue bowling all the regional stuff. Wow. Wow. It, it, uh, what kind of work do you have to put when you say to get to the level you want to, yeah. what does that require? Like well, is that with, daily? With, yeah. Routine? Well, like is, with me, it's like time on the water, dude. Yeah. All right. It, and, and I've said this a zillion times, bowling and fishing have so many things in common from a business perspective, from a tournament perspective, from a professional perspective. And for me at my age, I mean, I'm in decent shape. Yeah, I have some limitations, but I've had some great people that are helping me work through those uh, situations. But it's it's 40 to 60 games a week practice every single week. It's learning the technology. It's like... It's like, dude, if you're not dialed in in forward-facing sonar, (laughs) you're going to suffer, all right? You're going to suffer, and you're not going to be able to compete at the level of other guys because what are they doing? I mean, they are are getting PhDs in forward-facing sonar. Bowling's the same way, man. If you don't understand physics and the equipment and layouts and conditions, you're just going to be another dude out there having fun. So you have to you have to mentally really, really control what you can control. You have to educate yourself, and you have to put in the physical time to improving your game. Does that sound familiar? Does Very that sound familiar. anyway near the same thing that these guys that are out there fishing on tour do? It's the same thing. It's, 
I mean, to me, so so if you're playing 60 games a week, how many days a week are you bowling? Is that I, every day? I, I, no, I try. Well, after basketball's over, it will be just about every day. Wow. And I'm fortunate because the the center, the bowling center that I practice at and work out, they they cut people who had their PBA card a break. So it's not like I'm spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars practicing. It is a very, very good rate to where it's very affordable to practice. More games, more time on the water, more fish, more pins knocked down. It's pretty simple. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I'm yeah. interested to see how that all... We'll I mean, see. everybody wants... Dude, I may not go out and cash a single check, but you know what? I'm going to try. I mean, same <laughs> when you got into this. You, you know what I mean? It's the exact same yeah. approach. Um Okay, talk to me about the fishing world because one of the things that I love about you uh, <laughs> is is you're always thinking about what the future, where things are yeah. going, and that sort of thing. What can what 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 say you future yeah. of the fishing world? What you have left the fishing? You you know you're moving on to bowling and going to watch <laughs> this from the from the out from the outside, but. What state do you think you've left this sport in? Well, th there's two things in the advancement from technology that, that I'll mention here in a minute. But I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges for the anglers, like yesterday, I watched Jason Christie's YouTube channel now. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. It, 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 there, there's a lot of time and effort and, and money in production mm -hmm. costs being spent on the product that, that Jason has created. And I know his numbers are kind of down, but I think he just launched it in January. And the video that I watched had almost 30,000 views already. And it's just been out there for a few days. Uh, I never thought that I would see Jason Christie do that, say, yeah. five years ago. Never would have dreamed. Jason is one of the greatest anglers to ever come out of the state of Oklahoma. I mean, I, I've known that dude and watched him fish since he was, you know. Yeah. And the challenge that exists is, are these guys going to continue to be able to balance what I call, audi <laughs> you know, people have, aud uh, what is it, uh, autobiographies, where you have somebody else that, that yeah. you know, writes your story or, you know. If these guys are are covering their entire lives now when it comes to fishing and putting a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of expense into self-promotion because of the demands of, of YouTube and social media and everything that exists from this, I call it self-media side. Yeah. So how much, and I know we've seen guys that have been enormously successful, one being Brandon Polinick, that's been able to balance that that coexistence between self-media yeah. and the core product, which is catching fish in tournaments. The challenge for so many people out there, I still think, is being able to balance that, to get to that point to where now it's just a part of it, to where your revenue streams are coming from both sides. And Brand is probably the best example of that. But the pressure that exists, because let's face it, Dave, nobody wants to say this. But do people really want to watch guys that don't catch fish? No. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Because it's the fish. Yeah, the guy's the personality. The guy is who's really making it happening. But is the star of all this stuff taking place the fish? Because... What do people want to do? They want to catch more fish, right? So they think they're going to learn something from watching Jason Christie's YouTube channel, along with being entertained at the same time. Well, now you're, 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 you're trying to balance as an angler that, that differentiation between what you got going on the side and what the core product is, yeah. which is you going out catching fish. And if you going out, Catching fish doesn't happen. Well, then that core product is going to suffer. Do you agree or disagree? I agree a hundred percent, and I also agree. And uh, another point is, I don't think 
anglers in a lot of ways are being put in a fair situation. For example, even Brandon Polnick, that guy that you mentioned, that is probably one of the most successful at that as a tournament angler. Yeah. He's not getting financially what he should. Like if he never fished tournaments, that, that side of the business aside, and he just did his YouTube channel and he just, you know what I mean? Yeah. I believe that he'd be getting paid a lot more than he's getting paid to do what he does on YouTube. His tournament, but it's almost like if you look at tournament anglers from previous years, a tournament angler today has to do so much more than they ever had to do in the past. You know what I mean? Like agree hundred percent. They could yeah. focus on just fishing. And in our industry, it's like, if you're big on YouTube, that's great. We'd like to see you in tournaments. We'd like to see you on yeah. TV. If you're big in tournaments and that sort of thing, we want you on YouTube. It seems like the anglers are having to do more than they've ever done in the past. Yeah, so- I, I agree with that. And, and I still think that there is one core element that existed 40 years ago that still exists today. Although some people would argue with me about this, but performance sells. Yeah. Bottom line, you can have all the media stuff you have going on, but the thing that truly moves the needle is performance. Do you agree or disagree with me? A thousand percent. I mean, okay. and, and remove it from this sport. I mean, I use this example all the time. When Conor McGregor was knocking everybody out, everything he said sounded hilarious. And, and it, it was, it was a headline. And yeah. now when he says it, it doesn't have the same effect, does it? And it's no. he's still the same guy, and he's still, but because it's that aura, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's you can't you can't replace that, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. that's it is a weird time and fit. Like I wonder, you know, like in some ways, I look at the future anglers and I'm like, they'll be better than ever because they've got so much technology, but they're also like split apart you know what i mean like they have yeah. so much they have to do there is no off season you know what i mean it, i know it's dumb. um but at the same time let me say this dave for for the people and and i truly don't know what the number is i don't think anybody knows what the number is the number of people that are true professionals mm-hmm. in other words their sole source of income is truly dependent upon what they do on the water and what they do off the water at the highest level Does that make sense? Yeah. There are a lot of people out there that are doing things that, yes, they're generating revenue, they're generating income, and they're doing really good stuff. But to have that financial commitment to be able to be on a tour at the highest level and still, still have to have that side gig because of the demands that are put on them from the sponsorships that take place and the requirements of the sponsorships, it's not like it used to be. Heck, it's not like it was 15 years ago, Dave. It's not even close. I and agree. I think I think that the people that want to get in this game, and I I, I, I really do believe the influx of young anglers that we're going to see, and we're going to see some this year, and we've seen some over the past three or four years, that the equity that they put in in being able to balance business with performance is going to be the key to the new equation to success. You agree or disagree? I agree. I mean, it's already been proven that that's you have to be everywhere and you have to balance that. But I feel like there has to be a tipping point at some point. You know what I mean? And when you look at anglers that, you know, we, the example we've used is is a guy who's one angler of the year and stuff like yeah. that, talking about Brandon. But you look at the anglers that are just, can't, they're trying to get over that hump and they just can't. Yeah. I often think like, could you imagine how much better that person would fish yeah. if they weren't making selfie videos out there all day? They, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like it, it's in, and it's, you look at that. I mean, you're right. Nobody talks about it, but if you look at their social media, it, it's a never ending. It's like a monster that you just can't, it's never satisfied because yeah. if you do videos, then it's like, why didn't you answer the question that I had for you? Why didn't right you- here, I hear I'm going to ask you another question and I'm going to do the bowling fishing comparison okay. because I think this is dead on. The bowling industry is going through something that the fishing industry went through kind of in the early stages. The bowling industry is in the early stages right now. The fishing industry is way past it. 
from the promotion of product via social media and YouTube. All right now, everybody, and I do mean everybody, has a ball review of every new ball that comes out. Yeah. You know, getting up there, throwing it. What do you think happens every single time they throw the ball? Take a guess. It, but they get a strike. They get a every strike. Time. Imagine every time. that. Yeah. All right. I mean, who's going to show a ball review video where the dude gets up there and he goes 10 pin, 10 pin, 10 pin washout? Well, you should go buy this ball, people. It's just not going to happen. It doesn't matter what bowling ball you're selling on the planet Earth. All right. Unless it strikes, people aren't going to buy it. How many commercials, how many promo videos, how many YouTube videos have you ever seen where somebody's using something that they're selling where they don't catch fish? And not, not very no, often. No, no, no. Those ones no. don't get a lot of Because no, nobody wants to buy something that doesn't catch fish. So you got to show them catching fish. Yeah. Now, I get it, folks. If you're watching or listening to this, I know that there's some people out there that, you know, hey, we're going to go out and we're going to show you exactly what happens. I get that. I know that exists. But from a consumer standpoint, if you go out and you don't catch fish, what is the mental, you know, illustration that's taking place when it comes to your consumer behavior. Probably not going to buy that one. All right. So having said that, Dave, how many videos can you throw out where it's fish catch after fish catch after fish catch after fish catch? Well, everybody's catching fish on every single lure. There are no bad lures out there, Dave. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? I mean, you have evidently not tuned into my show. But <laughs> <laughs> I've been a little busy. I can now because I'm quite, retired. Quite okay? often don't catch him, Mark. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But. No, no, you're right. You're right. I get it. So where, what is it, like how, when you look at the future for anglers, I mean, when you, when you look at everything you're going to have to do, yeah. like at one point you've got anglers, like I'm amazed that the YouTube guys are even thinking about tournaments because – when I look at their world, I'm like, dude, you go and make videos and it's yeah. it's pretty cush. Now you're yeah. gonna come over here where literally it it is. I mean, I've seen growing men cry trying to make a living doing this, and I know you have too. Yeah. Um, it's almost yeah. not fair on them. Hey, what what's the the deal? I, I heard that late night on ESPN with uh it's on ESPN radio, I can't remember the dude's name, okay. uh, they were talking about uh, rappers want to be athletes and athletes want to be rappers. Yeah. You know, football players want to be announcers and announcers want to be football players. You know, you get this flip-flopping around where, you know what, man? If they're making money doing yeah. whatever they do and they want to dip their toes in that swimming pool that I talked about, more power to them. More power to them. But I think what it needs to happen and – that combine thing that, that took place at, where was it? Kentucky Lake? Uh, that, that, uh, I think it was, it might have been Wheeler, but yeah, no, I did combine that, that, that took Weldon place, put yeah. on yeah. and all that and everything. All right. I think that is a step, but I think, and, and this is just my opinion that, that I have said this numerous times. I think there needs to be some type of, not Q school, but some type of education that takes place for those people that are fishing. And I'm just going to say the opens that are fishing the opens. And if you have any indication, any desire to be a part and earn a spot on the Bassmaster Elite Series, well, you have to go to Q school. And in Q school, you talk to them about the financial commitments, how to manage your money how to take care of sponsors, how to position your brand on social media, how to act with the media. How do you handle the pressures of what takes place on tour? You know, rules, guidelines, off the water, on the water. You mentally prepare this person from an educational standpoint to where, let's face it, Dave, some people do know. Most people don't. And, and if I'm wrong with that statement, then, then somebody, hey, my email is still mark at basszone.com. <laughs> but most people out there, all right, don't. Heck, I don't. 
But the way that I learn is through the opportunities to capture that knowledge that is going to make me better at whatever I'm trying to do. But so, I think that's kind of happening. Like, I don't think it's happening like you say, like it's not yeah. in Q school, but I think that's what collegiate fishing is. Now, I get it. If you're a 35-year-old that gets into it, you are you don't get that opportunity. But when you see somebody like Mike Huff, like a Jacob Fouts, these guys and how – like I coined Jacob Fouts the paper boy because that's yeah. literally what he looked like when he fished. You know, yeah. he was like a little – you know, he's the kid who delivers the paper. And I've watched that kid evolve to – a scary enough monster to qualify for the Bassmaster Elite Series in yeah. one year. You know what I mean? And and when you see how polished, and I really think collegiate, and I was against collegiate fishing when it started. I remember I told mm -hmm. Jeremy Kinnis the worst idea was to let a collegiate angler in the classic because I was, it's all about the elite guys. Yeah. But I couldn't have been further from the truth because if you look at what college fishing has brought, but I think it's because those anglers, are coached no different than you coach them for basketball. You right. know what I mean? And they say, right. Hey, you're going to get to a lake and, and this is just fishing. This isn't the financial stuff and stuff, but you're going to get to a lake and you're going to need the drop shots. So you better go learn that where in yeah. the past you'd get guys on tour and they'd be like, yeah, I don't know how to do this. None of those collegiate kids show up in Waddington and look like they don't know how to do it because they've already learned how to do it. They push themselves through that collegiate program. So I think it's just the coaching. And so I think it is happening to a certain extent, but not a direct Q school that right. everyone that goes to the elites. I, I think you're right. I think that's more on the technical perspective. It's not on the life perspective. Yeah. All right. How many times have we seen guys just like we mentioned earlier behind stage at the hotel, they're in crisis mode. And part of the reason why they're in crisis crisis mode, they didn't know how to plan. Yeah. They didn't know what to expect, right? They didn't know what direction to go when certain things happen. And I think the guidance that would take place prior to them ever making a cast would benefit them, not only just from a knowledge standpoint, but I think that would make them feel more comfortable to get them ready from a performance standpoint also. Because let's face it, Dave, part of the stress, the biggest part of stress for most guys that are out there on the Elite Series is one thing, money. Yeah. Agree or disagree? A hundred percent. And it's all fixed by one thing. That's more fish. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. You know, and you can have a big banner in that room where you're trying to educate these guys that says, catch more fish. Because you're right, but it's how you manage what is going on, both on and off the water. From a technique standpoint, that's one thing. You got to make sure you got all your ducks in a row from a life standpoint, too. And I'm yeah. not trying to pry into anybody's, you know, 1099s or W9s or 1040 forms or whatever. I'm just, feel I, I feel very strongly that financial guidance needs to be out there, especially because think about how many young people we are getting, getting involved in the high level tours now yeah. that needs to happen. Yeah. But I would say that that needs to happen in every sport. You know what I mean? You well, take they, do. Any other... they do that, Dave. Why do they all go broke? <laughs> uh, obviously, have you seen the 30 for 30? Yes. They, they they make some <laughs> foolish decisions, Dave. <laughs> well, in fact, I, there's guys in the Elite Series who have wind down windows, but five inch lifts and big wheels on everything, so they make some bad decisions too. <laughs> in fact, I you're funny, man. In fact, I just uh, in my in one of my finance classes that I teach, we talked about uh, an NBA player that was a, a top five draft pick, and I showed the video where they were interviewing him and on uh, CNBC, and he flat out said it. He goes, I made poor decisions. I did not manage my money well, and I had all these people running on top of me telling me to do this, 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 and this, and I just wanted to buy a Ferrari. Well, next <laughs> thing I go, I got, I got two Ferraris. Then I got three houses. Then I got a lake house. Next thing I know, I'm broke. It's because he didn't know how to manage his money. Yeah. Didn't know what to expect. So I... I, for anybody that's ever watched or listened to the show, I, I I really have the angler's best interest from a business perspective. I think that's an important part. I think 
it is a very, very critical part of the decision that you make, whether you're a collegiate angler, whether you're a regional angler, whether you're a, a local stick, when you decide to invest in yourself and feel that your game is at the level to compete at the highest level and work your way up, that you better have a plan in place and you better have a financial plan in place too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the problem when people chase dreams, they get fogged up with dreams. It's a dream. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a dream. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it doesn't need to be a dream. It needs to be a nightmare that you have to do something else. Like that's sometimes really how, how you have to look at it. You're right, man. And sometimes it does turn into a nightmare, but man, no, but I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to make this the fortune 500 show of bass fishing or whatever, where we talk nothing but business. I am enormously grateful for the memories, for the experiences that I've had with people on the water, being on the road, the guests that we had on the show, that final uh, show that I did where I had some people that, that showed Very up cool. in the studio and the people that called in, man, that, that meant a lot. And, and I know earlier you asked me the question, do you ever just sit back and think about what you've done? Well, the day after or the day of and the day after of that show, I really reflected back at some of the, the things and, and places and memories. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I think I did it the right way. I think I met some great people. Uh, I think a lot of people out there uh, respect the fact that I did it the way that I did. And uh, most importantly, I think I've left the business in the hands of somebody that is going to continue the brand for a long time. So, yeah, I reflected. It was great. I, I, I could not be happier. I'm actually getting all my gear together fishing wise. And uh, I cannot wait until spring break because after spring break, uh, I don't teach on Fridays. So nice. every Friday I have off. So we're already planning up Fridays, me and the principal and the athletic director and, uh, you know, friends that, that I just haven't been able to spend time on the water with that we're going we're gonna to do that, and, and we are going to spend some time on the water. And uh, hopefully physically, you know, I, I've got a few years left in me to where I can uh, chase the bowling thing and, and spend more time on the water and just enjoy all the hard work that's been put in place for, you know, over 30 years. I think, you know, as a fan, like I said, I, I'm thankful for everything. I mean, I think independent media – is incredibly important in every sport and it was missing in this sport for a long time. And you were a trailblazer for that. And yeah. I have to tell you, you know, some of the things that, you know, the 20 foot deep things you've done, like we didn't even talk about that. Things, Dude, that was the favorite that thing. Elevated the sport in my opinion, you know, to yeah. really look at like, and people that people didn't talk about anymore, Robert Hamilton, you know what I mean? Like stories like that to me. Yeah that's the coolest stuff out there. You know, to me, you did things that nobody else was doing. And, uh, yeah. thank you for that. I mean, it's 20, no, it means you got to look back at that as one of your, I mean, is that the cherry on top for you or what, what yeah. would. Yeah. The, the Robert Hamilton interview, uh, I've had numerous people tell me that that was probably the most incredible interview that they ever watched and listened to from a guy who went, from the penthouse to the outhouse. And, uh, and when, when I found out the whole situation about the trophy, I was on a mission. And, and, and <laughs> I mean, I was, uh, I was truly an investigator from a journalistic perspective, trying to find out what the heck happened to this trophy and, and what went on with this bizarre story. And the work, the effort, uh, it just sitting across from this dude that thought that everything that he had experienced was because of the devil was just mind boggling. You know, the dude in the black coat, seeing yeah. the dude in the black coat in jail. And then the next thing you know, he wins the Bassmaster classic and he sees these doors and he walks through the doors and it's the same dude in the black coat came out of nowhere. <sighs> and, and it just, it gave chills up and down the dude that has the trophy. We offered him a, a pretty good chunk of money. Wouldn't, wouldn't sell it. Cause we were going to, we were going to, I was going to buy it and I was going to keep it 
hoping that Robert Hamilton would get his his life together. Yeah. And then eventually, when it, if and when that point come, we were going to give it back to him. Because I felt bad that the dude had to pawn his trophy. It's wild. It's- yeah, but it, it definitely the the most enjoyable and and rewarding thing that that I think I did was was that whole documentary. It was cool. I yeah. love those. Man. Uh, they they were very cool and. Yeah. Uh, and I honestly think that they're the kind of thing. I know you've got a lot of great feedback about it, but I think yeah. that they're the kind of thing as weird as it is. And it maybe it doesn't make you feel good, but in time people will cherish that even more because yeah. realistically you brought Robert Hamilton back yeah. for a lot of people that didn't even, you know, he's just a name on a trophy to a lot of people just, yeah. and uh, very, yeah. very cool stuff. So yeah, the behind the scenes stuff that, that I did with you also at the 49th Classic, that was really cool. And that gave a lot of people uh, a, a view of some of the things that take place at the, ca- at the Classic that they never get to see. So yeah. that was fun to do, too. Hey, man, I, I have so much to be thankful for, Dave. This sport has been enormously great to me. The people involved with this game have been enormously supportive and uh you know when i talked to zona you know i i talked about it i said man we're we're survivors because when this thing started think about all the people that were here when we started yeah and look at where they're at now and i am extremely proud to be associated with so many people that uh, there's no way that that matt and i get to the point that we're at if it wasn't for the support of people like you and everybody else that we have crossed paths with in, in trying to tell the story of what these guys are doing, catching fish, man. It's pretty cool. And it just goes back right back to where we started. You know what I mean? Like when you, <laughs> it, it, if, if you went, no, but like that relationship with Zona, all of those that happened yeah. because you were on the road. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you, you, we're trying to bring the story. You were, and and I think whenever anybody sees that, it's. Uh, I yeah. mean, it, it. That's the truth about life, if you ask me. Like literally, yeah. it doesn't matter how much talent you have, because we all know people that have a ton of talent and blow it. Yeah. Um, we see it every single day. It's have a heart, good work ethic, show up every single day, and yeah. be good to work with. I mean, that's honestly what it comes down to, if you ask me. Yeah, and dude. You've been incredible to work with. I mean, you you have always pushed people, made people think. You've always pushed people. I made some people mad too, Dave. Yes, yeah, you do that. <laughs> you do that. And I'm sure you're not going to stop doing it. But <laughs> that's also, you got to make people mad. To, it, that's passion. You know what I mean? I've always said yeah. that. Like working live events, people get upset. There's things, but it's people, you know, people don't get upset. The people that just don't care. Yeah. You've always got upset. Most yeah. of the time because you cared, I think. All right. I want to cut a deal with you, man. What's that? All right. Now, <laughs> how close? Because I know you, you, you got this. I, I've just seen pictures of your house. I haven't really seen, wow. you know, uh, what's around there or what's safe. Uh-huh. Heck, I don't even know where you live. I just know it's okay. in Canada. All right. Uh-huh. How close is there a bowling center to your house? I didn't mean uh, to there was you, one man. in town, but it went out of business. <laughs> no, there, there's I, I, about 30 minutes away. I think. Okay. That's not too far. Bowl. Yeah. No, All right here. Too far. Now, since I'm retired and, and obviously I'll we'll have to work around your schedule and, and, you know, summertime or whatever, however we can work it out. I want to cut a deal with you. Okay. Right? I am going to give, give you a bowling ball that uh, high, I mean, high performance bowling ball here. That will be custom fit. I'll get your measurements. I'll drill right. it out for you right over there. Okay. All right. And I'm going to make a trip to a destination that you tell me, but right. they got to have a bowling center by. Okay. All right. And we're going to go bowling and then we're going to go fishing. All right. Yeah. Is that a Let's deal? Do that. That's a deal. Let's do that. Yeah. I'd love that. <laughs> love that. You could stay right here. You can I, stay right here. Deal. Now we, they we have got- this. They have this funky thing called candlestick bowling. Hopefully, that's not it. Have you ever seen that? No. Candlestick? What is that? They, I, I've only seen video of it. It, it. You use a ball that's like the size of a shot put. Oh, is that it's like five thing. pin bowling? No. They have, I think it's 15 pins. 
I've never heard of that. I've it's heard a of big five thing pins in Canada, in dude. Bowl. Candlestick bowling. No. You got to make sure it's not candlestick, that it's a normal bowling center. No, it's a normal bowling center. Okay. Normal right. bowling center. On Friday night, right. they have rock and bowl. Make it all. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. You'll love it. <laughs> no, hey, that time that I come up there, we will catch fish, dude. We oh, will we will. Fish. We will. Right. Trust me. We'll be on them. I'm not bringing you all the way up here. I could never live it down if we didn't. But no. Uh, so that that's once again some of the things I'm looking forward to. But uh, yeah, I'm sitting in this chair. Believe me, I, I miss the chair. But dude, I am thoroughly enjoying life right now, and I'm going to continue enjoying life as long as I can physically continue to do the things that I want to do. Mark Jeffries, I thank you for allowing us to enjoy our passion, which is bass fishing through you for all these years. Yeah, man. You're incredible. And I will see you on the bowling lanes. Is it lanes? <laughs> is that what it, are, we, are we going to the lanes? Yeah, you can say that. We're fine. Uh, right. we're Come up in the winter. That. We'll go curling. That's almost like bowling, isn't it? That is. I, I would like to try that. Yeah, it's, it's embarrassing that it's a big sport here. It's really <laughs> embarrassing. There's, there's All right. Thanks, Dave, man. Take care. And uh, I'm going to see you soon, man. Thank you. All right. So it turns out that the toughest thing to do is interview the dude who's interviewed everyone. Jeffries took that whole conversation in a whole different direction than I ever expected. But that's what I love about Mark Jeffries. And that's also what I love about this show. I mean, all I can promise you is we'll be here every single Wednesday, even if I have to pre-record it like we did here. And I apologize for that. And it's not an interview. It's literally just a chat, fish chat, with uh, whoever it is next week. But I thank you guys. You guys have made this community something special. Week after week, you come here, and I promise you, I will always be here for you. And who knows who next week's guest is? That would take somebody a lot more organized than me. But thank you for watching this week. Thank you, Mark Jeffries, for everything you've done for this industry. Enjoy being. Have a good week. And hey... Leave me a thumbs up, a knuckles, or something in the comments. I'm still trying to become YouTube cool. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?